With the growing demand for the mainframe computers to be accessed by multiple users to increase productivity, it was in 1972 when IBM launched its VM370, which was also known as Virtual Machine Facility 370. It was the first hardware-assisted virtualization to be introduced on the IBM System 370, which was a very popular IBM mainframe computer back in 1972. That was supposed to be used with VM370. The hardware-assisted virtualization, if you don't know, is the capability to use a physical component to create and manage virtual machines. So in turn, what we are saying is, with the hardware that you have, you provide a capability so that you can create virtual machines. And there is one more request that I have from you is to keep an eye on the timeline that we have here. And for the virtualization to work with VM370, we needed something called as CP or what we also call as control program. And you will be surprised to know that CP40 or control program or VM-CP that we call was launched way back in 1960 by IBM, which was the first research-based operating system that implemented complete virtualization and which later on gave birth to the legendary CP67. But you might be thinking, but Sam, virtual machines can run because of the hypervisor. And you might be just wrong here. Where is the hypervisor? And I want to tell you that the CP or the control program that you see here is what we in today's time call as the hypervisor. And this is what the virtualization looked like. You have the system 370, that is the mainframe as the hardware. You have the control program, which was able to create an environment for the resources to be shared. That's the job of the hypervisor. And the virtual machine ran on top of the time sharing operating system that we had like CMS or what we also called as conversational monitor system. So your hardware was system 370, that was your mainframe. Your hypervisor was CP and the time sharing operating system was which later on was succeeded by VPCSS in 1968. Then in 1972, we had the full hardware virtualization using VM370. So these are virtual machine operating systems. And later on in 2000, IBM also released the Z series architecture for the Z VMs. And those actually might be also used till now. So, so that was a really big deal back then. And you might be thinking, why am I telling you all this? So don't worry about this. You will get to know the answers. So keep watching. Now, if you Google search for virtual machines or virtualization, you will see something like this. And there is nothing wrong with this. This as well encapsulates the basic idea of how virtualization works. So you have the hardware, there is your resource powerhouse on which a hypervisor sits on. And the hypervisor abstracts the hardware on top of which you host your guest operating system and then install your applications. In a way, you can say the hypervisor actually creates a virtual environment. Virtual here means you're not using the physical hardware directly, but the abstract of that and on which you host the application. But the elephant in the room still remains to the point that what exactly is a hypervisor? So let's check that out. If you check online right now, you will see a lot of companies having a virtualization platform that is the hypervisor like VMware, Microsoft Hyper-V. Every child in the room right now knows about Hyper-V, I think, or maybe has heard of in his life. And we also have Oracle, IBM, of course, and we have Citrix and Red Hat as well. But let's jump back to visualizing how actually the people who created this came up with this wonderful concept. So imagine you have a plot of land which you're planning to farm on. So it's a 30 by 30 plot, lush green and ready to be farmed. But as this is a large scale farming, there will be a set of prerequisites, isn't it? So you actually need the land to cultivate. You need the fertilizers, you need water, you need electricity, you need the right equipment and the farming vehicles as well. And you're ready to farm. But what if we need to farm different crops on the same land? Yes, we can hire more people. That's a start. But the first thing that you have to keep in mind is that you are limited on resources. So here you can see the available resources that we have. We hire three people to work with us, assign them a crop to farm on. To have the segregation in place, we bifurcated the land in such a way that we can farm on a segment of the land that we own. And we can assign the same to one of the farmers we hired. And we allocated a segment of the resource to each of the three farmers based on the land they occupy. And we actually got the best output from that. And if we wanted to plant another crop, we can assign a piece of land to the new farmer that we hire from the resource pool that we currently have. And there is one point that you should always remember that it should only be within the capacity limits of the available resources, not more than that. 
So I'm sure you're getting the point here and keep this example in your mind, but change the farmland to your own system and the farmers to be the operating system and you being the hypervisor. And this is actually close to what actually happens in virtualization. And that is the point where I tell you that a hypervisor is a software, firmware or even a hardware that helps you run virtual machines on your system that you currently have. So if you see the design here, we have the base hardware, the hypervisor that sits on top of that, like a VMware or Windows Hyper-V and you create your virtual machines on top of that and you're good to go. And you can install your applications and make use of them like you would on a regular desktop or laptop. But the main thing that you have to understand is that think from the perspective of the operating system. As an operating system, you are not worried about if you're running on an actual hardware or if you are not the only operating system that is installed on that machine. You just want the resources and you're fine with that. Similarly, the other operating system we have here runs in isolation, not getting affected with the Ubuntu operating system that is running on the same machine. And this kind of hypervisor that is rooted onto the BIOS and sits in between the VMs and the hardware is what we call as a bare metal hypervisor or also known as the type 1 hypervisor. And this is the kind of setups you will see in your organizations as well. A bare metal hypervisor runs directly on the host machine hardware to manage the guest operating systems. Yes, the OS that is installed on the machine as a part of the VM is basically called a guest operating system. And now you have to tell me what kind of hypervisor CP was. Yes, it was a bare metal hypervisor and that is why VM370 was a hardware assisted virtual machine operating system. So I hope you got the point here. But wait, I am still not convinced yet. I didn't understand a few things here. So if a hypervisor sits in between VM and the hardware, what does it actually do? How does it assign CPU or memory? And for that, I think we need to dig a bit deeper. I hope you're not bored yet. It's really going to be interesting moving on. Just hold on to that. So back in the day, we had a pool of people who wanted to work on the same mainframe computer or system which were very scarce and way more expensive than you may actually think and giving every user their own system was not feasible. So what these mainframes did is they provided their users with a capability called time sharing. What this meant was the machine will serve its users by providing them a slice of its time to perform or execute the instructions they wanted to carry out. As and when the time slice was completed, it would move on to the next user to take up the pending task or move on to the next task and give that user its share of time. Still not getting the example here? Let's simplify it further. So you have a task scheduler which would hold the task list that are supposed to be executed from all the users. The scheduler would then pass the instruction to the central processing unit for execution. If it's completed within the time slice, it's awesome, you're done. And if it did not complete the scheduled task within the time slice that was allotted, the task moves back to the preempted program list. And here you can see we have the time slice of around two hours. And I know you might feel what will happen if my task execution is not completed. Here, the word that you see preempted is your answer. So preemption or preempted is the act of temporarily interrupting an executing task with the intention of resuming it on a later point of time. So based on the scheduling policy that we have here, I think we have the round robin. So your task will be executed in that particular time. So still having doubts, is it? Okay, let's simplify this even further. So each user that you see here was provided with a virtual machine. Yes, they were provided with a virtual machine. So in a way, each of these users felt that, or if you have to use an appropriate word for this, it would be perceived. So they perceived that they were actually using the real machine or real mainframe all by themselves. The mainframe that we have provided as a hypervisor, which is also called as the VMM or the virtual machine manager, which would actually help us manage and coordinate these virtual machines and thus the name VMM. It's a kind of a notion here. So, but the best part about this was that the hypervisor was such a boon to the system designers because it took the overhead from them in allocating resources and managing multiple VMs running on the same mainframe and that would do the job for them. So what does the hypervisor actually do? So the hypervisor takes care of allocating resources such as CPU time, 
memory storage to the virtual machines giving them their share of computing resources and on the other hand the virtual machine is a compute resource that uses software instead of the physical hardware or the components or the computer itself to run its program and deploy applications but the time sharing is not used that much because we moved on to the real time multi processing systems or the rtos and then to the gpos that is the general purpose operating systems like windows and others and that is what exactly gave birth to the other type of hypervisor that we use in today's time and this is where we have actually reached so here you have the hardware that is your resource powerhouse on top of that you install the host operating system like windows or linux and on top of that you install a special type of hypervisor on the operating system alongside with your existing applications which would help you run your virtual machines and this is the type 2 hypervisor and also called as a hosted hypervisor the name is basically no brainer because it's hosted on the operating system itself so a hosted hypervisor runs on the conventional operating system just as other computer programs would run and in a way you can run multiple operating systems on your machine with the help of the hypervisor which is called the guest operating system that runs as a process on the host so the operating system that you install as part of the vm on the type 2 hypervisors is called the guest operating system for this type of hypervisor and that actually runs as a process on the host and if you see here we have the hardware configuration of 16 gb 8 core cpu 10 gb of hard disk the hypervisor has the capability to take a portion of this resource and allocate it to the vm for it to operate and function so with the help of a hypervisor what we did was we created a vm with 4 gb ram two vcpus or virtual cpu and for storage we allocated 10 gb of hard drive and we created one more with the same configuration but one thing that you need to understand is that you cannot use the already allocated resource so you must ensure it does not impact the overall performance of your system because if you have 16 gb and you assign most of them to the vm you will risk having a very slow performance for your own system itself because you will not have enough memory to run other applications and for that vm apps actually come with a restriction on how much resource you are allowed to allocate so that actually is one less thing to worry about and coming back to the topic again the biggest difference here is that unlike the type 1 hypervisor that abstracts the actual underlying hardware the type 2 hypervisor actually abstracts the guest operating systems from the host operating systems giving it the illusion that the vm is directly talking to the hardware but instead it actually in reality gets its resources from the hypervisor itself because if you're running a windows operating system as your host operating system and you have a linux guest operating system or the vm operating system how does it matter to the vm that you're running a windows machine it's not like it'll unfriend you it actually doesn't know what you actually have because the type 2 hypervisor actually tells the guest operating system that this is your 2v cpu or the virtual cpu 8 gb of ram 20 gb of hard drive go and work as if you are the actual operating system on that particular hardware and this type of hypervisor is what we have used a lot i'm sure you guys have used oracle virtualbox or the vmware workstation and please let me know what's your favorite vm host in the comment sections so we can have a debate there